Ow. So welcome. Um, again, my name is Laura and I work in the alumni office. I'm so glad you're joining us. I'm excited to travel to um, Iceland today, this afternoon, since that's all we can do right now. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, I ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat button for the questions, and then we'll get to as many of those as we can after Ben does his presentation. I'd like to welcome Professor um, of Earth Sciences, Ben Edwards. Ben started at Dickinson in 2002, and he has taught classes on minerals, rocks, soils, environmental disasters, Arctic climate change, and volcanoes. His main research focus is interactions between volcanoes and glaciers. Uh, ben first visited Iceland in 1995, and he's been making regular visits there ever since to study the island's volcanoes and geology. He's taken many groups of Dickinson students to see Icelandic volcanoes, as well as led a trip for alumni um, to Iceland, Italy, and the Galapagos Islands recently. Ben has traveled across the globe um, to study ice volcano interactions and climate change including Russia, Alaska, British Columbia, Chile, Peru, Greenland, and the Canadian High Arctic. So um, today Ben's going to talk about Iceland, the land of fire and ice. And with that, I turn it over to Professor Edwards. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's, uh, it feels a little bit like fall in Carlisle, especially if you get up early, but uh, uh, the, the house is cool enough in the afternoon, so I'm wearing my appropriate Icelandic field here for you today. Um, this is, uh, for anyone that knows sweaters, this is kind of a distinctive classic Icelandic sweater pattern. Um, and, and this was actually knit for me by one of my Icelandic friends. Um, so just quickly, um, I will tell you a little bit about how I got interested in Iceland, the land of fire and ice. And then most of the talk today will be um, focused on a few of the different projects that I've been able to do with students and alums over the past, well, 10 plus years in Iceland. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna leave, I, I'm definitely gonna leave some people out I, and, and I, I'm not doing that on purpose, but we've had a lot of different students there over the years and um, hopefully we'll continue to be able to take students there. But my, my first trip to Iceland was actually in 1995. Um, I was working on my uh, PhD at the University of British Columbia in Western Canada. And it turns out there are some, some volcanic uh, similarities between uh, volcanoes in British Columbia and volcanoes in Iceland. So I was very fortunate to have a great supervisor at the University of British Columbia. His name is Kelly Russell, and we still do work together 25 plus years later. Um, but Kelly took me to Iceland to look at some of these volcanoes so I would have a better sense of, of what I was trying to understand in, in, in British Columbia. And so my first trip there was in 1995, and I've been there, you know, almost two dozen times. Um, between now and then, and it's become almost a yearly thing for me to do. And um, so I was kind of disappointed not to be there this year, um, especially because there's some exciting things going on. But we will, uh, I'll share with you some of the work we've, we've done in the past um, in Iceland and um, feel free to ask questions. I will try to stop along the way and answer them. Um, but also please feel free to, uh, um, Hold your questions till the end. Um, please use the Q&A function as uh, uh, has already been mentioned. Um, I do see a few people are using the chat and I will try to look at that too, but it'll help us if, we, if we're mainly focused on the Q&A. Okay, so Land of Fire and Ice, I'm Ben Edwards. Uh, we're gonna have a special guest appearance from an alum um, who uh, been to Iceland with me and then went back to do some master's work, Amanda Santilli. Um, she's gonna fill you in a little bit on what she's done there. Um, but let's let's kind of have an introduction to, to start off thinking about Iceland and, and what goes on in, in the land of fire and ice. So in Iceland, a lot of what we see at the surface is driven um, from the fires below. Iceland sits on top of two tectonic plates. And as those tectonic plates move slowly apart, um, hot molten rock that we call magma moves up in between those plates to fill the gap. And um, that, that produces volcanoes. And in Iceland, you can see more of a volcanic system than you can almost anywhere else. Um, so the main, the main picture that I've got as a background here that's got sort of the gray and yellow and, and orange colors, this is actually taken from inside a volcano. 
So there's a, th this is an old um, volcanic uh, uh, magma storage area that some cavers found um, many, many years ago, and, and it's been developed in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so one, one, uh, one summer, we got to take students down into um, inside this volcano. It's, a, it's, it's now our tourist attraction. It's called Inside the Volcano. And um, the Icelandic name for this place is called Tri Nukagigal. And it, it literally means three volcanic cones. And one of the cones basically has been emptied out of lava naturally. And so you can, you can get on a scaffolding and do a, a, a little cart ride down um, about 300 feet to the floor of this volcano. So you can see the guts of the volcano. And then of course, what Iceland's more famous for is what you see down the lower left, which is actually watching an active volcanic eruption. Um, this is from the uh, 2010 eruption that kind of put Iceland on the map for a lot of people. Um, the the Eyjafjallajökull eruption, um, and that eruption actually started as as what they call a tourist eruption in Iceland. You can see these people are within you know probably two or three hundred meters of the lava in this little small cone, and um, we uh, I was there with the student James Hackler in July 2010, and even though most of the activity had stopped, you could actually still find in a few cracks uh, glowing lava. Um, so. Iceland has fire uh, that comes from below to the surface, but of course there's also fire in the skies. And um, Iceland is, is one of the places that is, uh, one of the premier places on earth actually you can go to see the northern lights. And the northern lights happen up in the atmosphere. They have to do with the uh, radiation from the sun coming to the earth's ionosphere. Um, and so uh, we, we actually had a trip planned <laughs> for 2021. And uh, it's, it's, we're not quite sure if that'll happen, but if it doesn't, uh, hopefully we will be able to do an alumni adventure in March of 2022 to go and see the Northern Lights in person. Um, but even during the summer, sometimes Iceland sky looks like it's on fire. Um, so I've also seen some of the most spectacular sunsets in my life um, from some of the summers that I've got to spend in Iceland. And then in between the fire in the sky and the fire uh, below, you have ice. And, and that's you know, what the island of Iceland is named for. And um, so there is a lot of ice in Iceland, um, but it's only about 10% of the surface of Iceland that's covered by ice. And so you find ice in lots of different venues. Um, on the left, um, this, th these are essentially fields of ice that are um, from a glacier that's coming down from Vatnajökull, which is um, one of the largest ice caps in Europe, and it's the largest ice cap in Iceland. Um, and and as, the, as the ice, which is solid, comes down over hills, it bends and the ice cracks. And so these are uh, the, the texture in this photo on the left are mostly um, what we call crevasses that are formed in the ice as it's come down um, over uh, uh, terrain below it. Uh, we also have ice in the water. The picture on the, uh, in the upper right is from Jokul Sorlon or the Glacial Lagoon, it's, it's a very famous place for tourists. And it's a place that uh, is now a large lake at the end of a glacier. Um, and so when you drive to the edge of the lake, oftentimes there are icebergs. Um, you can see there are birds flying around and sometimes there are seals because this, uh, this little lagoon is only a few hundred meters from the ocean. Um, and uh, so you also have, have, have water uh, that's got frozen water in it. And then finally, there are several places where you have smaller amounts of snow and ice um, the view in the lower right shows Hecla Volcano, which is one of the most famous volcanoes in Iceland. Doesn't have very, very much glacier ice on it now, um, but it does have uh, lots of snow in the winter. So what I want to do today um, is talk to you about three different things. We have, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the volcano research we've done. Amanda will join me towards the end of that. We'll talk a little bit about glacial research, and then we'll end with a few pictures that, that uh, show you some of the past and, and give you some ideas for future Dickinson and Iceland trips. Um, so here's a, here's a map view of Iceland. Um, this is from the uh, online catalog of Icelandic volcanoes. Kind of exciting right now. Um, each one of these little flags is a different volcano. And if you go to the website, you can click on this and they have all kinds of information um, about each of the volcanoes. One of the things that's exciting is there's actually a yellow flag. And a yellow flag means there's a volcano that's getting ready to erupt. And, uh, or, or they think it is anyway. And this yellow flag is at a place called Grimsvatn, which is uh, an ice-filled volcanic caldera in, in almost in the middle of Vatnajökull. And it's one of the most um, active volcanoes in Iceland right now. So it's not really very surprising. 
but they monitor it relatively closely and the activity has slowly been building to the point where um, they're, they're thinking now that it will be ready to erupt maybe in the next few weeks or few months. Um, this eruption, this volcano is pretty isolated, so um, it doesn't uh, impinge on people too much, although it does actually produce some relatively large floods that actually travel from the volcano to the edge of the glacier. And then uh, those floods come out um, across these plains, which are called the Sandur Plains, um, and uh, eventually go to the ocean. You do see this red line at the bottom of the map. That actually is Iceland's main uh, circumnavigation road uh, or, or, or highway. And so um, when this eruption does happen, one of the things that will be a concern is uh, that this highway or sections of the highway may actually get washed out. Um, they, have, they have pretty strong bridges and they have, uh, this happens frequently. So the, the Icelanders know what to do to repair things quickly and to minimize damage. Um, but that's always a concern um, from the, the eruptions from these larger volcanoes. We're gonna look at three different areas today. Uh, we'll spend a lot of time down at uh, the bottom of the map here where it's labeled number one. That box is around Eyjafjallajökull, which is a long island mountain glacier, it's called. And, and that's where the eruption in 2010 happened. And uh, I've done uh, research here with a number of students. Um, we're gonna dodge over quickly then also to Askia. Um, and Amanda will tell us a little bit about her research there. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit about some of the research I've done um, with, with a bunch of students um, much closer to Reykjavik. Um, very convenient because it's, you can get there really quickly. You jump off the plane and you can be um, on the volcano looking at rocks in 20 minutes. Um, so it makes for a convenient place to work. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is a number of things that um, came out of one of the first research projects that I've done on an active volcano or a very recent eruption. So much of my background and work in British Columbia and other places has been on older volcanoes um, where we try to look at the volcanoes and understand uh, the timing of how they formed and also understand um, if we can reconstruct the, the climate conditions surrounding the volcano when the volcano erupted. Um, so in the eruption 2010, I was, I was quite fortunate um, with the timing. I was able to get a small grant from the National Science Foundation, thank you very much, and also uh, National Geographic. And it allowed me to travel for three different seasons um, to work on different parts of the very famous 2010 AF Fjallajökull eruption. The first summer, um, if you look at the guy on the left, that's James Hackler. Um, he's a, a geology alum and he was able to go with me that, that first summer. We were there in July of 2010. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, there were places we could find some cracks in the lava flow and most of the lava had solidified, but you could actually look in those cracks and see where there was still really, really hot glowing orange lava. Um, and one of the big things that we were able to work on and, and publish a research paper on actually was um, what happened to the lava flows that were erupted um, from this first part of the eruption um, on top of snow? So uh, the picture in the upper right, you can see a glowing orange lava uh, moving across basically what looks like black sand. Um, what you can't see is underneath that black sand, there's snow. And one of the um, very interesting observations that we were able to, to make out of this uh, study of this eruption, and this is worth with several Icelandic colleagues, was that lava flows, even though they're really, really hot, um, they also move relatively quickly. And if they move quickly, they can actually flow out on top of snow and ice, which is kind of non-intuitive. Usually people, if you think of a lava flow uh, moving across snow and ice, like we have in these cartoons down at the bottom, you'd think that the lava would, would melt right through the snow and ice almost instantaneously. And it turns out that's not the case. And, and there's a number of field observations that confirm this. But one of the things we were able to do is, is actually look at some measurements that were made of how fast the lava flows are moving. So if you look at the graph in the uh, upper, uh, upper left, you can see um, there's, there's velocity, meters per hour on, on the left-hand side, the y-axis, and on the bottom axis, the x-axis, we have temperature. And anywhere above that little line at the bottom, any, any, any uh, lava flows that are flowing uh, at speeds that are above that line, move too fast to melt the snow and ice in front of them. And so they actually will march out across on top of the snow and ice. Now what happens after several hours is of course, then they do eventually melt through the snow and ice 
And, and the picture on the right here, this is actually a picture where you can see a lava flow that actually initially came out on top of the snow, but over the course of, of, of 20 to 30 hours, actually melted down through about two to three meters of snow. So that was one of the interesting results that uh, we were able to sort of help confirm um, during the course of the research on, on uh, this, this phase of the famous 2010 eruption. I was also able to work on um, a couple other parts of that eruption. It was a big eruption. There were lots of people interested in it. And so after 2010, I went back with um, Rebecca Rossi in 2011, she's on the left, and then Ellie Waz in 2012 on the right. And we were actually some of the first scientists to get to go inside the glacier, essentially to look at this, uh, uh, the lava flows that were produced during that eruption. So um, the famous um, part of the eruption, the famous pictures you would have seen where you'd see a big cloud of ash going into the air, coming out of the top of, of a glacier. Um, this this uh, uh, satellite image on the left, it's mostly white. This is what the glacier and the volcano looked like before the eruption. The satellite image on, uh, sorry, on the left, the satellite image on the right that's, that's now mostly black. Um, that's what the uh, volcano looked like in August of 2010. Much of the ice has been covered by ash. You can see that there's actually a lake um, just about where that arrow ends um, that, that's, that's formed um, in the volcanic cone, which is, which is inside the, the glacier. And then the lava flow actually came down and melted its way through the glacier. And I'm tracking it right now with my mouse and the lava flow almost got to the end of the glacier, not quite. So when we first were there in 2010, it was actually too dangerous to go into uh, that area because of um, poisonous gases from the volcano. Um, in 2011, uh, we had access to, to helicopters. And so um, uh, Becca and I and our Icelandic colleagues actually flew in by helicopter to land on the lava flow and get samples and do some mapping. Um, and then 2012, I went back with, with Ellie Wass. Um, and I, actually, Jim Shiroka is also uh, down at the bottom by the helicopter. There's our, our helicopter pilot um, who's dropping us off on the volcanic cone that actually formed inside the glacier um, during the 2010 eruption. So we we're very fortunate with the timing. We got to spend a lot of time doing research and, and we published some papers on our results um, that were really a, a, a unique situation. Most of the time, very few scientists actually got to go to the places that we got to go. And I was just very fortunate to have great collaborators in Iceland that allowed not only me, but also Dickinson students to go into this pretty, pretty amazing terrain. And our information uh, is quite important because if you flew back over this volcano today, um, you wouldn't see any of this. Basically, the glacier has filled in on top of almost all of the lava flow and, and the summit crater. And so the data we were able to go and collect is really one of a kind data um, because now it's covered by ice again. And you know, we don't know when that will be accessible, um, hopefully not for a long time, because if it's accessible again, that'll probably mean that the glaciers have all melted. So we're, we hope that doesn't happen too quickly. Um, but anyways, that, that's the work we were able to do on, on this recent eruption. Um, the other thing, uh, I, and a lot of the work we've been doing, and, and Amanda's coming up at, in just a minute here, a lot of the work that I've done historically has been looking more at using volcanoes to try to understand Earth's climate. And, and there's a simple explanation for why we do that. If you look on uh, the, the left where it says Ice Age Earth, these are reconstructions that have been made showing where we think uh, the maximum distribution of ice was uh, about 18,000 years ago, which, which was the, the height of the most recent um, period in the ice ages. The, the, the globes on the, on the right, um, you can see the North Pole, uh, North Pole projection in the upper one, um, the, the Antarctic South Pole projection uh, below that, modern day, you can see the extent of, of glaciers um, and, and, the, uh, and if you look on the left, though, you can see that um, 18,000 years ago, we think much, a much larger area of the Northern Hemisphere, almost all of Canada coming down the Northern uh, part of the United States, all of Iceland, quite a bit of Europe, was buried under glacial ice. And we can come up with models, theoretical models, um, that predict what climate was like back then, and that, that will also make predictions about where there was ice. But the problem is, how do you test those models? The ice is gone. There's some places that the ice left a few deposits that we can find, but the deposits typically left by glaciers called glacial till are really susceptible to being eroded. 
Well, one kind of rock that is not easily eroded is volcanic rock. And, and so in a place like Iceland or in, in Western Canada, where I've done a lot of my work, um, when you have a volcano that happened to erupt through the ice, as, uh, as what happened in 2010, we were just looking at pictures of that, um, you form unique volcanic deposits that you can go and look at and, and, and tr interpret them as being formed beneath ice, in water beneath ice. And so if you can, if you can find an ancient volcano and make that interpretation, then if you know how old the volcano is, you know there had to be ice at that spot when the volcano erupted. And so it's what we call a paleoclimate proxy or a tool that we can use to look back in time in places, it only works in places where there are volcanoes though, but we can look back in time and actually use these ancient volcanoes to kind of be um, 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 points of truth for climate modelers um, because they can, they can produce all the models they want, um, but unless there's data to test those models, um, we always have to be uh, uh, skeptical of, of the science that's being done um, if it hasn't been well tested. So if we go to the right now, um, Iceland at the height of last glacial maximum, we also think was totally covered by ice. Would have really earned its name back then 10,000, 20,000 years ago. Um, and of course today, only about 10% of the land area is covered by ice. And so Iceland's in a very same, similar position. We wanna understand how this last large um, uh, ice sheet retreated, one of, the, one of the ways we can do that is by looking at volcanic deposits of different ages and trying to find volcanic deposits that we know formed under ice versus deposits that didn't form under ice. And so uh, this is just um, from, from a paper in 2008 showing uh, a couple of different reconstructions. And, uh, and so some of the work that we've done just south of, of Reykjavik, um, some of the work we've done um, will be able to aid some of the interpretations um, eventually as to when ice left the, the area around Reykjavik. Um, I'm not the only one that does this kind of work though. There's several people that do. And one of them is um, our very own Amanda Santilli. And uh, uh, so she's gonna tell us in a, just a minute about her field area. Um, and I just wanted to uh, kind of show you quickly um, one uh, set of pictures that illustrates some of the kind of work that I've been able to do with students. Um, and these are, these are places, there's a map in the upper right, uh, you can see in box two. Um, so we're just outside of Reykjavik. And um, fortunately for me in this location, um, Icelanders are very practical. Um, they, they have a limited uh, amount of rock types to use for things. And so um, they're very resourceful. And one of the things that uh, they, they use, it turns out, is a rock called pillow lava. And pillow lava is one of the most common types of lava on Earth, but we rarely see it because most of it forms in the mid-ocean uh, mid ridges. And so there's lots and lots of pillow lava on Earth, but most of it is under the ocean. So we can't actually see it unless you're in a submarine. In Iceland, however, we can see it because pillow lavas form when a when normal lava flow goes down into water or is erupted underneath water. And instead of being kind of a flat, pancake-shaped lava flow, the lavas form tubes, and they stay in those tubes as they move underwater. And um, just outside of Reykjavik, there's a number of places where they've actually mined into these volcanic ridges, and so they're great places to go and take students, because you can see um, very clearly um, what's gone on during the construction of this pillow volcano. Um, so this upper long photo um, in the, in the uh, upper left, um, is, is, a, is a, a, a photo mosaic of one of these uh, research sites and below it we actually have a reconstructed geologic map. And here we, we think we can see at least three different layers of pillow lavas that we think formed by different eruptions. And so by, uh, by taking lots and lots of students, we probably had somewhere between 10 and 20 students um, come and work in these quarries because there are lots and lots of pillows to count and measure, <laughs> and you have 100% exposure. So uh, no, no excuses for not having a complete map because there's nothing covering up the rocks. You can see everything. Um, but uh, we've gone with several different students, and, and this is actually Stina. Um, she's she's my, my, my friend who knits a sweater, um, and she's also a geologist in Iceland. So she uh, comes out in the field with us sometimes. And we, we come and we look in detail at the shapes of these, these rounded pillow lavas. And what we're seeing in this picture, um, all these sort of lobe-shaped things, you, you can kind of get a sense of why they call them pillow lavas, because of their shapes. These are actually um, 
there actually cuts through these lava tubes. So if you imagine my fingers are lava tubes, what we're seeing uh, is what we see when we look at my fingers like this. You see how we see these rounded sections? Those are really cuts through these lava tubes that would actually have looked like this when they formed. And all of these things formed underwater. And in this particular spot in Iceland, um, on the Reykjanes Peninsula, there are no lakes, certainly no big lakes. And our elevation is, is over 100 meters above sea level. So the, the ocean level, as far as we know, has never been this high. And so the question is, how do you get water <laughs> deep enough to make pillow lavas on the Reykjanes Peninsula? And, and really, the only plausible solution is that if this whole area is covered by ice, then you have an eruption that melts a hole in the ice and forms a lake. And now you have, you have lake, you have a water body into which pillow lavas can form. And there are lots of techniques we can use to map the pillows. You see there's some uh, um, Alex Purpelage and Liz Placencia, a couple of alums from about six or seven years ago. Um, uh, Liz just started actually at a master's program at Yale University um, in environmental science. Um, but uh, we've had lots of alums in these quarries. We can measure the shapes of the pillows. We can collect volcanic glass and analyze water in the volcanic glass that was trapped there during the eruption. And that sometimes can actually give us an estimate as to how deep the lake was. So um, these volcanic deposits actually contain a lot of information about what the environment was like when this volcano erupted in Iceland underneath a glacier. Okay. So now we're going to jump to Northern Iceland and, uh, and, and I'll let Amanda talk to you for a few minutes. Um, she's been to Iceland multiple times, but, but this is some of the work that she's done um, during the course of her master's degree, which she just defended this spring, I think. Amanda? Uh, July, yep. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Santilli and I am a member of the class of 2017. Uh, so while I was at Dickinson uh, in the Earth Sciences Department, I had some incredible, incredible opportunities to travel to a wide range of places, including Iceland. And it was also at Dickinson, in, uh, in fact, in a couple of Ben's classes, that I discovered my love for volcanoes. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to go back to Iceland for my master's thesis, uh, which focused on a volcano in central Iceland called Askia. And Ben asked me to briefly go over my research. So the first image here, uh, labeled number one, uh, is just a picture of the summit at Askia. We had a very nice uh, weather day for that one. And like Ben was saying about uh, the interaction between volcanoes and glaciers, uh, Askia is one of those older volcanoes that was glaciated for a portion of its history. And by examining the minerals that were within the erupted rocks from before, during, and after the glacier, I wanted to determine what the impact of that ice was on the volcanic system. So in image two, uh, you can see the post-glacial lava flows around Askia that are color-coded by age, uh, which were the bulk of what I was sampling, and an inset map of Iceland, uh, again, just like in the upper corner as well. I used a microscope to examine the minerals more closely, and images three and four are two of the samples I collected. Uh, they're called gabrozenolis, so they came up from the Earth's mantle. And then moving on to the last image and my conclusions, uh, one thing that I did find was that from before the glacier formed on top of Askia, it was erupting fairly small crystals. However, once the glacier was in place, it added that ice pressure, it added pressure on top of the volcano that kept some of those crystals beneath the ground, and it caused them to continue to grow larger. So when that glacier retreated, when the pressure from the ice was gone, uh, there was an eruption of large amounts of magma that began, and it brought up those large crystals, in addition to those gabrozenoliths. After that period, the system began growing small crystals again. So I was kind of looking at the difference between the um, influence of the ice on the volcano. And so that's a brief summary of my research. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, my email is in the bottom right corner and I would love to chat with you about it. Thank you, Amanda. Always good to hear your voice. <laughs> you too. Um, so uh, uh, Amanda and I had some interesting adventures in particular uh, uh, in, Iceland, in uh, Greenland um, that you have to ask her about sometime. Um, okay, so, so that's basically the first part. We've done a lot of volcano research. Dickinson has a lot of connections to volcanic research in Iceland. 
we certainly anticipate continuing that. <laughs> I have several projects that uh, we're working on writing up right now from, from a number of different places. And uh, next time there's an eruption, I'm always looking for a plane ticket. So if anyone wants to go with me, <laughs> you have to let me know. Unfortunately, right now, I'm not sure Iceland will let us in, but, but hopefully in a, in a few months, uh, that will change. Um, the other thing we've been able to do in, in Iceland, um, it does have glaciers, and, and this partly came about um, from work we were doing on some of the volcanoes. Um, but because we spend a lot of time around volcanoes that are covered by glaciers, eventually the glacier part starts to rub off on you. And we started to, to, uh, had, started to have some students who actually were more interested than the, in the ice than the volcano. So Small Liberal Arts College, what are you going to do? You learn about glaciers. Um, and so I've been around glaciers quite a bit of my life. I hadn't done many formal studies, but uh, I'm starting now to have a, a number of students that are working on um, trying to understand glaciers in, in particular response to climate change. And um, so one of the things I just want to quickly show you is to go back down to Aya. And one of the things that um, was quite interesting about this eruption is um, it actually did some damage to one of the glaciers. Uh, not too surprising. You remember the picture we saw a little bit ago with the glacier all covered by, by uh, snow and ice. Um, well, it turns out that uh, um, there's a number of different ways that glaciers can be impacted um, by, by volcanoes and other things um, in addition to climate. So one of, the, one of the struggles is if we're trying to figure out you know, if a glacier is, is getting small or retreating, um, we want to understand how much of that uh, loss in ice is from uh, simply climate getting warmer um, or maybe less precipitation, those both could, could impact the ice, um, versus other things that can happen to a glacier. So this is just a really quick overview of, of glaciers in Iceland. There are six major ice caps, um, probably 20 different periods of glaciation uh, in, in the recent geologic past. Um, a lot of Iceland's uh, glaciers, for better or for worse, are sitting on top of volcanoes. So um, there, there's lots of opportunity for the glaciers to be impacted by volcanoes. And, and uh, some of the big uh, eruptions that have impacted glaciers relatively recently, Katla volcano, which is down here in the south, is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in Iceland. It's huge. It's had a, quite a big eruption in 1918. Um, Hekla volcano is much smaller. It doesn't have a lot of ice on it anymore, but during the winter it can have a fair bit of snow. 1996 Galp eruption actually was just in between Butterbunga and Grimsvatn. And then of course the 2010 A eruption we've already seen a little bit about. And so I had two students, Billy Dogherty and Kruna Saw, who both uh, were interested in glaciers. And, and I'm gonna show you uh, a few figures. These are all figures from, from Kruna's thesis. Um, and she's just starting a graduate program in Switzerland actually this year, master's degree. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a, a few of their results. So. Um, Billy worked on Gyokul Glacier. Karuna uh, then picked up that work and added, added in some work at Steinholt Shokul and Kaudaklip Shokul. And um, the, the main idea is that these three glaciers all were impacted to some degree by the 2010 eruption. They're all being impacted by climate change today. Um, but they, two of these glaciers have, have had other events that have impacted them. And so the question that, that Billy was asking along with, with uh, Karuna was trying to understand, try to document and understand these different impacts on the glaciers to see if they could still determine whether climate was having a big impact or things like volcanic eruptions or in the case of Steinal Chokel, landslides that actually come down on top of the ice and bury it, whether those kinds of events are actually having a bigger impact from, than climate changes. Um, and so these are, these are some of the results. Um, this is a, a pretty typical thing if you're looking at um, if you're trying to understand what, what's happening to glaciers today, there's, there's uh, in Iceland, um, we have um, topographic maps that go back to at least 1907. So even though those maps aren't perfect, um, we, we can use them in some ways to get a sense of where glaciers were more than 100 years ago. And so by, by looking at those maps and then looking at um, air photos from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and then modern satellite images going up to today, we can have over uh, a hundred year record of what has been happening at the, the, the ends of these glaciers, the termini of the glaciers. And so that's what you're seeing in these, uh, these three different pictures for three different glaciers, um, Gyokul, Steinholt Shokul, and Caldeklip Um 
uh, Gyoho, uh, on the left, you can see it, it's had almost two kilometers of retreat since 1907. Um, it has actually had a small advance. Um, so so these, the ends of these glaciers are dynamic, um, but the glacier now has retreated so far, um, it's actually out of this picture. Um, Steinel Jokel uh, was not impacted as much by the eruption in 2010, um, but it still had 1.5 meters of retreat. And, and a lot of this area, uh, you can just see a little bit of the glacier at the bottom here. Most of this area is just debris now, but, but quite a bit of this debris actually was deposited during, uh, by a landslide in the 1960s. It actually covered up some of the ice. And that may actually have, have actually preserved the glacier a little bit because if you dump a lot of rock and dirt on, on a glacier, it doesn't necessarily, it's not totally intuitive, but basically that blocks the sunlight. And so that actually will protect the ice and, and slow it down from melting because it insulates the ice during the summer so the ice doesn't uh, melt quite as fast. And then finally, Caldeclip Shokel, also about 1.5 kilometers of retreat. Um, it's on the south side of, of Aeopithe Yokel. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's kind of a narrower glacier at its terminus. Um, so it hasn't probably lost the same volume of ice, but the terminus has retreated about the same amount as uh, uh, the terminus for Steinholt Jokel. So Giyoko's had the most um, rapid retreat, um, and it's been most, the most directly impacted by the volcano. Um, Steinholt Jokel has also been impacted by the volcano, but had a landslide that might have slowed down some of the melting. Um, but Caldeclis Yokel, as far as we know, um, has not been impacted nearly as much by the volcano and, and there's no evidence for any landslide deposits. Um, so Billy Do Doherty worked mainly on uh, uh, Giyokel and then uh, Karuna put all these together and looked at these other two glaciers so that we could actually uh, uh, calculate some rates. And this is sort of the, the, the end summary of her study. This is a very busy slide. It's kind of pretty with the colors. Um, you don't need to know too much in detail. Uh, about each each panel here, but basically um, these panels are looking at changes in elevation of um, these three volcanoes for different time periods. So time period A1, um, we, we looked at the difference between a, a 1945 glacier um, uh, three-dimensional model and 1960. Um, for B1, we have 1960 to 1994. For C1, 1994 to 2010, and D1 is 2010 to uh, uh, basically the present. Um, and uh, red colors are, are, are colors where you've seen changes, negative changes, um, so where ice has been lost. And you can see for most of these panels, ice is, is being lost at the edges of the glaciers. Um, the one, one exception here is, is C1, and this is quite interesting because uh, what you see in C1, that red, that's, that's the lava flow. That's the lava flow that erupted in 2010. So you can see all the ice that was lost um, uh, during the course of just really a few months um, from the eruption. And then if you look at, at this last set of images, that area is now blue, um, which sounds like it's good for, for, for the, the glacier, but the truth is um, that's, that is ice that's, that's filling in about 100 to 150 meter um, uh, uh, canyon that's been cut down through the glacier. Uh, actually, we do have a question here quickly, um, and I will, uh, uh, we're getting close to being done, so David, David, if you can hold on for just a few minutes, I'll, I'll get to this question, but um, we're getting close to the end of the formal presentation, so um, I will just quickly run towards the end, and, and we'll get back to this question in a minute. We can always go back and look at slides if we want to um, uh, when we're done. So, so anyways, th this was just to give you a, a little bit of a sense of the flavor of the kinds of research that I've been doing in Iceland with, with Dickinson students. Um, and uh, and hope, hopefully we'll continue to do that. Um, we have a, a, a number of um, different programs where we take students to Iceland, um, but students have helped us do work on active volcanoes. Um, I'm also a, a drone pilot now, so we can, we can uh, increasingly we can do work um, that's remote, so that's relatively safe even if we're near a, a volcano that's erupting. Um, most of the work we've been doing is on older volcanoes and that's aimed at trying to do this, this uh, climate reconstruction that I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and, then, and then finally, we also have students that are working to understand glacier changes. And actually Professor Strock in the Environmental Sciences Department has gone with me to Iceland a couple times. And she's actually now working in Iceland as well, looking at 
methane production in, in Icelandic lakes. And so she's got her own crews of students that she takes there. Um, so uh, ju just a brief overview of these, these programs. Um, some of you know this, some of you may not, but uh, through very generous support of um, a couple of our alums, um, we've actually now started uh, an Arctic Studies program at Dickinson. And as, as the, part of the run up to that program, um, we had funding to take students on expeditions really all over the Arctic. And, and the map you see in the background, these stars are all locations that we've taken students as part of this program. It's a research experience program. Um, and uh, we first started trips in 2014 and Amanda, uh, actually there was a trip in, in 2013 as well, but uh, uh, first trip I went on was 2014 to Amasa Greenland and Amanda was on that trip. We had interesting things that happened. And you can see that you know, we, we basically covered almost half of the Arctic at this, at this stage um, with, with taking students on trips. We would have been in Svalbard <laughs> this past August um, if, if the situation had been slightly different. Um, so we're, we're hoping that 2021 or at, at worst case 2022, we can get to Svalbard. Um, that would be the furthest north for us, but also would get us um, sort of more than 180 degrees uh, across east-west coverage of the Arctic. And then uh, we really just have to get into Russia, and then we will have covered the whole Arctic in our program. Um, and the point of this program is to, to uh, provide field research opportunities for students, but also to educate students. The Arctic is, is, is a critical place in many ways. Um, the resources that we need to protect there, there's resources that are probably going to be exploited. Um, but, but even more importantly, um, the, the, the Arctic is really important for the Earth's climate as a planet because there's a lot of solar radiation that gets reflected back into space from the Arctic due to, to snow and ice cover. And that's one of the things that keeps the whole planet at a relatively nice temperature that's not too hot. And as we lose uh, more and more of that ice cover, um, we're gonna have, we're gonna increasingly have problems um, trying to stay uh, cool down, uh, really even, even in Pennsylvania where we live. So it's, 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 a, it's an amazing new program. Um, uh, uh, our, our benefactors are John and Susan Pohl. We have the Polar Expedition Fund now um, that, that's going to provide funds for us to continue to do some of these trips. Um, and uh, every once in a while, we have an alum that joins us on these trips. So uh, if you're interested, you should get a hold of me at some point. Um, but speaking of that, uh, these are some pictures from one of our Iceland trips. Um, we also actually have done formal uh, class trips, but also alumni trips to Iceland. And, and this is one of my favorite pictures from our 2017 trip to Iceland. We had over 20 um, alums and, and spouses and friends that went on this trip. Um, and uh, this, was, this was our fire and ice trip. We have another trip um, all planned. Now we just need to go ahead um, to go and, and do a Northern Lights trip. But um, I'm always happy to go to Iceland for just about anything. So uh, if, if there's certainly in, in future, I, hopefully we'll be able to come back and do more fire and ice trips in Iceland. Um, this trip was mainly a, a bus tour with sh short walks. But certainly in a place like Iceland, it's also quite accessible and, and easy to do trips where um, uh, we, we're doing a little bit more walking and, and even trekking type things. So lots of opportunities in Iceland. Uh, uh, we have, a uh, through myself, Professor Strock, some of the people, we actually have a lot of connections to Iceland. And so it's quite easy for us to do trips there. Um, it's a very safe place for us to take students. Um, and and uh, because of that, because of our connections with, with Icelandic researchers, it's a great place to go because the students get to interact sometimes with some local scientists. Um, but we can also do projects that are ongoing that in the end turn into scientific publications, which is great for the students, but it's also great for Dickinson to be contributing to um, some Arctic science. So I'm going to leave it there. And, uh, and, and now the question and, and, and answer a thing is open. I can also see the chat window, uh, uh, but uh, I think we've got a question from David. Uh, David Cates. Um, and so I want to get to his question first, but please feel free to type questions um, into the question and answer um, uh, queue. And I will, um, I will use that uh, as a way to sort of make sure that I don't miss anyone's questions. So David asks, how much of the retreat is related to volcanoes versus climate change? So that's a good question. And that's something um, we're still working on trying to um, come up with a final number. But Probably it's, it's, it's the majority. Um, the study that we did uh, at, at uh, Cataclysm Schiokel, um, it had almost the same amount of retreat as Steinholt Schiokel, 
And Caldeclipse yokel really has been uh, not impacted uh, in a significant way, uh, as far as we can tell from um, the 2010 eruption. So most of the treated Caldeclipse uh, um, yokel is just from climate warming. Um, Giocal has had extra retreat and probably part of that is, is damaged from the eruption. Steinholz yokel maybe a little bit more damage from the eruption, but then it also had this landslide that might have, have actually uh, been, been um, helped preserve the terminus a little bit. Um, William has a question. When will the next fire and ice trip be? And when will the Aurora trip be? Well, it depends on when um, the Icelanders uh, uh, feel good enough uh, to let us back into the country. Um, of course, right now, it, we wouldn't want to be traveling, be in a plane for six or eight hours. It's, it's not a great thing to do. Iceland is relatively, relatively COVID free right now. So they're, they're being very strict on, on who they let in. If you go, you have to quarantine for at least a week um, in, in your hotel room. They bring you food um, to make sure that uh, you haven't brought anything with you. So it really wouldn't be practical to go until things change significantly. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that at the very least by 2022, um, March 2022, uh, hopefully we'll be back in Iceland. There's a chance it could happen this, this spring, but right now uh, I, I, I'm certainly not I plan on that for sure. Um, we don't really have another fire and ice trip um, booked at the moment. Part of that depends on you all. Uh, if, if there's interest to run uh, this trip again um, or to run a similar trip in Iceland that maybe goes to other places or does a few different things um, than the, the, the trip that we uh, took initially, um, a lot of that just depends on demand. If there are a lot of alums that would like to go on, uh, go back to Iceland on an organized trip, um, it's, it's a pretty easy place to do this logistically. And we've got some great partners in, in uh, Alumni Global Adventures um, who organized a trip for us. We had an Icelandic um, a native Icelander on the bus at all times, and he and I could go back and forth. He knew a lot of the geology as well, but he knew much more the uh, natural history and the political history of Iceland. Um, so it was a great trip. We had a great time. Um, so you guys just have to ask if you want to go again, and, and Laura will be happy to help organize something, I'm sure. That's right. Email alumni at dickinson.edu, and I will see that. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, um, Paul has a question. Um, he said the topic's a bit far afield, but he's asking me my thoughts on, on uh, um, a volcanic eruption that was in the news uh, a year or so ago uh, at a place called White Island um, in Australia. And um, or sorry, in, it's actually White Islands, New Zealand, south the coast of New Zealand. And and this is this is an important thing. It does relate a little bit to Iceland and, and some of our other volcano adventures. Um, uh, just over a year ago, we were in Italy and we actually hiked to the top of Stromboli volcano and watched it erupt. Um, it was having very small eruptions, fortunately. Um, and and actually, a couple months after we were there, someone was killed um, on the island by an eruption. So. You know, any, any sort of, of trip you take, there's always possibilities of, of things not going the way you want them to go. Um, White Island uh, is an active volcano. Um, people knew it was an active volcano. The people that went on that trip knew they were going to see an active volcano. Um, the activity, uh, there's some debate about, given the level of activity, whether they should have uh, uh, closed it down. Um, I'm not an expert on that volcano. The people in New Zealand, have lots of volcanoes, so they are very much expert. And I know lots of people in New Zealand that study volcanoes, and I would trust their opinions. Um, it, it's just a, it's just an unfortunate tragedy, and and it's you know whenever you travel, you're getting in a car to go to the airport, probably the most dangerous part of your trip. Um, planes are certainly safer than cars, we think, um, and and certainly when you're hiking around, um, the odds of something happening are not very good. If you go into the mouth of an active volcano you know, your risk factor goes up and, and you just really have to determine how much you want to see the active volcano and, and uh, um, what risk you're willing to take. You know, I, I've walked on moving lava flows before um, in situations I felt were relatively safe. I don't think I would do that with a student, um, but I was in a situation that I felt very comfortable with. I'd been around the lava flows for a couple of days. We knew what they were doing. So I, I felt like I could do that safely. And some of the science that happens, you know, we have to go and get samples of the lava flows. I can fly around them with my drones, but I can't get a sample yet with, with my drone. So if I want a sample of a, a, a flowing lava flow, I have to go and get it. And that means I have to get relatively close. Um, uh, we don't do that very often and we're very, very careful when we do, but that's part of the job. Um, 
But as a tourist, you always want to be careful. There are lots of volcano tours. There's lots of volcanoes you can visit that are active. And, and if you're going to do that, um, certainly you want to go with a responsible tour operator, but ultimately, you know, you're responsible for making the decision to go to the volcano in the first place. And uh, any, no volcano is 100% safe. And so uh, everyone please remember that if you get a chance to go look at a volcano. Um, I've been to several erupting volcanoes and, and, and I, I try to be very safe. And so far that seems to have worked. Um, uh, uh, William's got another question. Visit, uh, have I been to Sertse? Um, I have not been to Sertse. I've flown around it. Sertse is an island just off the coast of Iceland that actually uh, formed, it was born in the ocean. Uh, in, in 1962, 1963, uh, fishermen were out and the water started bubbling up and, and pretty soon rocks were shooting out of the air and, and, and we actually got to see the whole formation of that volcano. Um, Surtse is a really special place. You can't go there um, except with a very, very special permit. They're trying to not, uh, they're trying to let the island basically form in a natural state and still study it. So they do have scientists that go there every year. They study the plants that are being recolonized. They study what's happening to the rocks but they have to wash their boots uh, to make sure they don't bring anything with them. And they're very careful to make sure that nothing is being transported by people onto the island. Um, I do, Surtse is a type of volcano um, that's similar to what I study. I, I don't study a lot of volcanoes that formed in the ocean, but the volcanoes I study did form in water. It's just water underneath glaciers. So a lot of the deposits that happen at Surtse um, are, are similar to ones that I study in Canada, in Iceland, uh, some other parts of the world. I, I do some work in South America as well in Chile. Um, but, uh, and I read a lot about Cersei, but no, I, I haven't been. I certainly would go if I got a chance, but um, it's, it's very, very rare to get a chance to go. Any other questions? Um, Amy Miller has in the chat, what got you interested in geology and volcanoes in your career? Oh, well, Amy, great question. Um, I, I grew up in, in, in the West, and uh, there's, there's a guy named John McPhee that's written some interesting books about geology, and, and he says that you can tell what kind of a geologist someone is if you know where they grew up. <laughs> and so um, I grew up out in Wyoming, and, and there are lots of old volcanoes in, in parts of Wyoming. Of course, Yellowstone is, is also in Wyoming, but I lived like the opposite side of the state. I grew up in Cheyenne. Yellowstone is in the northwest part of, of Wyoming. Um, I always knew I loved the mountains. I was a Boy Scout. I camped. I, I hiked. I fished. Um, I, I, uh, I did. Uh, I've actually lived in Yellowstone for a couple summers as a park ranger and also pumping gas at the gas station. Um, but I didn't really know. Probably until um, I started my PhD, I really didn't realize that that I wanted to be a uh, that I wanted to study volcanoes. And that was sort of a random chance, uh, an opportunity I got to go do some uh, volcano adventures up in northern British Columbia. Um, that that's another another story because um, I have lots of lots of stories and adventures from British Columbia. But um, I think geology, a lot of it was being interested in mountains and and having um, great professors. At a, I went to uh, Carleton College, you know, the great small liberal arts college. They had a great geology department. They they still do. Um, and my professors there uh, showed me some of the big scale things. How do mountains form? How do tectonic plates move? And my imagination was really captured by those big scale concepts that, that are really planetary scale processes. And from there, you know, as my interest grew more and more, then I was able to sort of uh, 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 inspire myself to learn a little bit more math, a little bit more physics, a little bit more chemistry. Because of course, if you want to study the earth in detail um, uh, nowadays in the modern world, you really have to put all your studies in the context of basic science. You know, so we use math to describe things quantitatively you know, a lava flow is moving because of physics. The crystals that Amanda was showing you, those are growing based on thermodynamic principles from physical chemistry. And so um, once you kind of get the bug and you get the interest to understand a volcano or a glacier, um, then that can kind of inspire you to take you through some of the, um, the hard work you have to go through to actually learn how to study things quantitatively so you actually can understand or try to understand uh, what's actually happening to, to form the rocks that you're seeing in the field. Great. I don't see any more questions. Um, so Ben, I'd like to thank you so much for giving us a little vacation of our mind, at least, um, with your um, talking about Iceland and how Dickinson is, has um, so many great opportunities with Iceland. 
Um, if you have further questions uh, for Ben today, may they email you, Ben? Yes, absolutely. Okay. My, my email is just Edwards B. So my last name, first initial at dickinson.edu. Um, make, make sure you mention maybe that, uh, um, you know, there are questions uh, arising from um, this, this, uh, uh, this little event. So that'll just help me uh, keep things <laughs> in context. I get lots of emails these days. So um, it, that, that will, that will uh, make my answer uh, speed up through the internet. <laughs> so I'll, I'll know exactly where you're coming from so I can quickly say, oh yes, I know what you mean and, and, and give you an answer. Always happy, to, very happy to hear from alums um, about about really anything. But you know, obviously for me in particular, volcanoes, glaciers, climate change, the Arctic, um, flying drones. I mean, those are all things that are that are kind of my my, my passion right now. Although I am straying into rattlesnakes and 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 uh, and soils. <laughs> uh, Professor Scott Boback and I are doing some research on rattlesnakes in Colorado. Um, the rattlesnakes are living in an old volcanic rock, so I mean, it does tie back to my expertise. Um, gotcha. And uh, uh, my drone work, we, we go out and fly a lot at the farm because it's a, it's a nice wide open space. And uh, uh, drone work is great for studying volcanoes, but it's also a critical part of agriculture these days. So it's great for students to get some experience um, using uh, some of the techniques that are um, sort of cutting edge for a whole bunch of different things. Wow, how about that? Well, Ben, again, thank you. Thank you to our participants. Thanks for joining us. I hope to see you at um, some of our other upcoming virtual events and hopefully in person again soon and maybe even on a future trip to Iceland. Um, yes. we, we do hope we did have a plan for spring break so that Ben could join us. We had a plan for March of 2021. It's not looking very good, but Ben is holding spring break 2022. So yeah, cross fingers. Email yeah. Laura. Encourage your friends to email Laura and say, we <laughs> want to go to right. Iceland. That's <laughs> right. Amanda, so. Amanda thanks for, for uh, helping out. And uh, yeah, we have a great, we have a great, uh, uh, a great set of connections in Iceland, although our connections really, especially with volcanoes, go all over the world. Um, so if you have other ideas for trips, you can always suggest those to Laura as well. Um, but thanks for joining us this afternoon. You guys all have a great yes. Thursday and, and enjoy your weekend. This is our fall pause this weekend, so I'm going to hopefully pause and get outside. <laughs> I'm going to have to take my no sweater off. It's actually starting to get kind of hot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.